Even those of us in what appear to be peaceful countries are deeply involved in a war. It's a social and a political war. It is a war of ideology versus freedom of thought. It is a war of industrialism against healthy environments. It is a war between the included and the excluded, between the individual and the constraints imposed by impersonal institutions. A vast majority of the world's population consists of defeated people in this war. In fact, we are more than just defeated. We are kept. Kept in fear, kept in awe, kept out of touch with one or with each other and the earth that gives us life. It has been said that our chains are long and our cage is big, yet we are still prisoners. Coercion is everywhere, including the necessity to sell our labor for a wage forced obedience to laws, conscription into imperial armies, and compulsory moralities and schooling. The occupying physical forces are essentially the police and the army. Over the centuries, we've eternalized much of the values and ideas of, our con of the conquerors and thus been assimilated into the ways of the obedient and domesticated. But I'd like to explore our physical occupation not the various skins that we must shed and the fears we must lose. If people want to claim space, then they have to be prepared to fight and defend it. This space could be permanent, uh, a liberated region or a village, or temporary, squats, wilderness camps, legally or illegally built shelters, or autonomous neighborhoods. It could be based in a village or regional secessionist movements, access to land by popular movements, or uh, indigenous assertion over traditional territories. Those of you familiar with the events in Kanesanake, a Mohawk reserve outside of Montreal from which the cops were physically chased out of town a while ago, are aware of how successful an organized martial action can be. Canadian anarchists and other insubordinates have an in have an incredible amount of insight and inspiration to glean from that event. People can claim space if they get organized and aren't afraid to lose a few teeth. With this in mind, perhaps a look at history generally will help us discover how others in our predicament have successfully organized themselves martially. There are countless examples of rebels organizing themselves and winning a few battles. Official history is written by the conquerors. Their self-congratulatory folklore is that we, rebels, have always lost because the conquerors were superior and thus had superior weapons. Most of us assume this is true, so we might as well not even try a martial approach because we're sure to lose. But this isn't the case. In North American history, for instance, the dishonest image of the technologically advanced Europeans overrunning the primitive savages needs to be re-examined. All, all over this continent, the indigenous peoples rose up and used martial skills to repel the invasions. In most instances, at least initially, they had some success. Let's look at an example from the, one of the very first invasions. In 1521, in what is now called Florida, the Calusa and the Tumukwin defeated experienced conquistadors under Ponce de Leon and Hernandez de Cordia Carbra. In fact, both of these conquerors died of wounds inflicted by the Calusa. For half half a century, the indigenous tribes repelled the Spanish in that region. The invasion by Dilan and De Carbia was the fourth invasion by Spaniards repelled successfully by local tribes people. Throughout the invasions, there were numerous examples of success. In many instances, the indigenous successfully defended their territory for decades. Some even seceded for generations. Europeans would not have ultimately won without adopting some native technology and skills. Even as indigenous people also adapted European technology and tactics. In his excellent book Warpath, author Ian Steely explains that the Spanish crossbows had failed to compete 
to compete with the Imrandian longbows that were six to seven feet long, thick as a man's arm, and very accurate at 200 yards. Although Spanish armor had been effective against most arrows encountered on the three continents, these arrows penetrated six inches of wood and even Spanish breast and back plates. Attack needs to be organically organized in a broad, horizontal, diverse way. And if it is based within entire communities, I think that it, is, it has a better chance of succeeding. Regional and village-like secessionist movements might be expressions of this, but so too would occupy sites. Centralized authority cannot control magnitude of rebellious fronts. Regions, villages, reserves, and neighborhoods, each with its own focus, its specific uh, expression of anti-authoritarian self-organization. For all the criticism, criticism anarchists have heaped on the Zapatistas and Chiapas, I think we have more to learn from them than the other way around. Also, by collaborating with or at least acknowledging indigenous actions for autonomy and territory, we can be part of something much larger, something quite close to what some insurgent communitarians, radical ecologists, anarchists, and other rebel rebels are aiming for. Part of breaking out involves shedding all those ideological skins grafted onto us through schooling, the mass media, living and nuclear families, etc. But my involvement with rebels over the past 25 years tells me that most of us already know that this is important. What we don't seem to inventory is the means available to us to counter our physical occupation. After all, it is only by rid ridding ourselves of organized coercive authority that we will truly begin to have a to have real opportunities to profoundly transform ourselves and to take back our lives. Can a local area succeed or succeed against this coercion and against the imperialism of the market? If so, what are some of the first steps? Part of being an insurgent today could involve acquiring martial skills. Martial traditions include everything from fighting techniques, fighting theory, group cohesion, earth knowledge to skill with a weapon this isn't a call to armed struggle but for the inclusion of a neglected aspect of a more all-inclusive approach to rebellion most simple weapons are also useful tools and we should make use of them in that context for instance by learning hunting skills then bringing home some wild meat to share with friends so we can stop relying on dumpsters and food banks and jobs as well as using them for self-defense or to chase away our adversaries. The bonus is that our possession and familiarity with them could be extremely useful in a crisis situation or during a popular revolt. The prisons are full, the factories and mines are full. A small class of people calls all the shots. A wave of extinction is dunning the planet, a tsunami caused by a system that is imposed from above. Entire populations are on antidepressants and anti-anxiety pills. We need to regroup and heal and make plans for reappropriating our lives, encouraging individuals and groups of rebellious people to get some training and survival and martial skills seems like common sense. These various individuals and groups would help create a new anti-authoritarian culture that includes a widespread acceptance of a martial component. Rhetoric and politeness have ruled us for too long. A more martial approach should be given an opportunity to contribute to attempts at creating new relations, relationships grounded in imaginative, healthy cultures. The support for militia skills could translate into anti-authoritarian militias or other semi-formal groupings that exist over time, or more fluid entities like the Black Bloc that manifest themselves spontaneously and informally when the need arises. Either way, the intention is that there are groupings of individuals able and perhaps willing to help their neighbors, comrades, and friends claim space to express anger, resist the plundering of their habitat, and help in various group 
grassroots uh, initiatives to fight back through the practice of martial approaches. When a squat is about to be evicted or a wilderness camp burned by authorities, for instance, they might show up and give moral or physical support with their training and ability to act strongly as a group. Whether groups form or not, by being inclusive and encouraging as many friends, neighbors, and comrades as possible to explore martial ways, a stronger, more resilient, and threatening anti-authoritarian culture will be given an opportunity to emerge. Canadian rebels can take advantage of the relative freedom and openness of our society and get these skills and tools before the chains shorten and the cages shrink. The reaction to September 11th events in the U.S. proved how quickly an open society will bring in draconian laws to protect the elite. The systems they depend on and the values that allow such systems to exist in the first place. We are all occupied peoples. The occupation is partly maintained militarily and our response should therefore be, in part at least, a fighting one. But I don't want a warrior-like eth ethic to be the center aspect of my community. I want the wisdom of the elders, the spontaneity, playfulness, and br brutal honesty of the children, and the caring, ch careful, ch uh, careful chiding and questioning of the past, of the past fist to also be essential aspects of my resistance. Otherwise, we'll end up with martial societies rather than societies with martial skills. I'm not suggesting the acceptance of a fighting elite, but an anti-authoritarian culture that values martial skills and tactics generally. Training in self-defense, widespread use and knowledge of weaponry, popular study of conflict and confrontation, general encouragement of fighting back and standing up, etc., might all be central. The trained fighters I want to encourage are motivated by a concern and caring for others in their community. They aren't based in small, sacrimonious cliques. However, they care about others because they care about themselves, about their immediate experience as individual, unwilling conscripts of authoritarian civilization. I want to encourage the rising up of a combative spirit in the best sense of the fighting spirit of North American indigenous warriors. Our fighter exists to claim space for herself and others. In this newly freed up space, we can have an opportunity for genuine exp experiments and living. Part of preparing ourselves for revolt should include the study of military history, the principles and ways of warfare, mostly because our adversaries are well schooled in it, but also because these offer insights and principles valued to anti-authoritarian rebels as well. Many of us are familiar with some of the classics, Sun Tez, The Art of War, Musha's Book of Five Rings, Chi Gorilla's Writings, Mao's Musings, and analysis and the works of Clauschwitz, for instance. But these are only some of the works, many from an authoritarian or vanguardist perspective and clearly inadequate for the emerging martial culture wanting to resist or to claim and defend space. We could also look at the history of anarchists like Makno China or the Darudi column, for instance, how they got started, how they were organized, as well as at some of their specific battles and how these were won or lost. We can learn from the mistakes of countless past attempts. Anti-authoritarian rebels don't have an, an elitist leadership and aren't centrally organized. Federations of independent camps should be encouraged, but these alliances should be fragile agreements. Ultimately, it is in not becoming too formally linked that we will succeed in permanently breaking the existence of, the, of political monopolies and large-scale infrastructures that tend towards congealing into authoritarian organizations. The notion here is to be a small part of to be a small part in helping create a world of free individuals, of healthy ecological environments where self-organized groups of free humans can live. This new focus of rebell rebellious people on the history of the military response to social conflict 
conflict should obviously be well complemented by also including the struggles of indigenous and other insurgent groups. In this respect, we could also look at the Meta's rebellion around the Red River Val Valley and the Society of the Masterless Men in Newfoundland. For instance, we'd all we'd benefit as as well from uh, a study of the battles of war leaders like Crazy Horse. Tum tum fuck. This new focus of rebellious people on the history of the military response to social conflict would obviously be well complemented by also including the struggles of indigenous and other insurgent groups. In this respect, we could also look at the Mentis Rebellion around the Red River Valley and the Society of Masterless Men in Newfoundland, for instance. We'd, we'd benefit also from a study of the battles of war leaders like Crazy Horse, Tecumseh, uh, Chief Joseph, Pontiac, Geronimo, as well as events like John Brown's attempted seizure of the armory at the Harper's Ferry and countless other examples. A study of the military attempts of anti-authoritarian and indigenous rebels that focuses on specific battles and strategies that either won or lost the fight can lead many uh, can lead to many useful insights into the art of revolt. A look at the Padawatamine, for instance, who lived uh, according to open and free principles, who struggled to survive while caught up in the conflicts between the French and English colonial powers reveal secrets of successful warfare. Here's just one example. In the spring of 1755, British Major General Braddock led a large army of, of colonial militia and regular troops from Virginia to destroy French forts on the Ohio River. His guiding advisor was young colonial George Washington. Here's a description of what transpired from James Clifton's book, The Potawatomian. On June 8th, the British were approaching Fort Duquesne in western Pennsylvania, site of present-day Pittsburgh. Seeing that the British were camped and on the alert, the Potawatomian war leaders persuaded the French not to attack. Instead, they planned to attack the British troops the next day while they were on the move stretched out in a mile long files along narrow forest shrouded trail the su their surprise attack was a complete success colonial uh, washington tried to counterattack in the indian style but was defeated they suffered nearly 1000 dead and wo and wounded out of the 1500 on the trail that morning they abandoned most of their equipment and supplies Braddock was mortally wounded. Washington barely escaped with his life. He learned a life-saving military lesson from this disaster, one that he would regularly give as advice to his own generals when sending them against the British and Indian forces. Beware of surprise. In military theory, a su surprise is one of the most potent weapons available. We should keep that in mind that a study of historical combat shows that surprise increases the combat power of, of fighting forces. Surprise, combat effectiveness, defensive posture, these are all multipliers that can help. Shouldn't this knowledge be generally available and understood among anti-authoritarians? The following are just a few examples of way that anarchists could be or already are using martial tactics in present day struggles. Opening up new fronts in, sol in solidarity with other rebels engaged in confrontation and action. Encouraging defection within enemy ranks. Avoiding capture. Blockades. Unarresting a comrade. Spying to gather information on the enemy's plans. Interrupting the enemy's means of communication. Raids on the enemy's stores of food and weapons. Physical battles that expand territory freeing captives from enemy prisons, destructions of, destruction of enemy arsenals, destruction of enemy wealth, secret codes and other means of communication, 
creating clandestine camps in which to hide friendly fugitives, fleeing to areas outside of the enemy's control, increasing the ability to fight as groups. Like all strategies involving territory and occupation, the defeated have a myriad choices in terms of how they live out their lives, but the, but the choices are more limited if we can agree on what our aims are, on what success is, and what constitutes, constitutes an acceptable quality of life. Were the Warsaw Ghetto inhabitants who rose up against their Nazi tormentors ethically responsible for the killing? Should they have continued to accept daily humiliation, suffering, violence, and death? Yet, at the time, there were those among them who argued against the uprising on various grounds, including moral, moral ones. Oftentimes, it isn't a question of who is more successful, but agreeing on what success is. In the case of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, those who participated felt that victory was standing up to their oppressors and risking death rather than continuing to live in Nazi hell. For others, success is uh, measured simply by staying alive at all costs, even if that meant being a traitor or accepting defeat. For others still, victory is measured by being morally superior, by never adopting means and ways of the enemy, even if that meant suffering and death. All rebels who want to overthrow the pr uh, present social order in favor of a more just and imaginative one need to ask themselves not only what is acceptable radical behavior, but what are acceptable conditions of living. Standing up to bullies who, who run things and assert some territory, territoriality within which we can learn to live in harmony uh, with each other and the world around us seems reasonable to me. While waiting for objective conditions to be right or other such Marxarian concepts seem unacceptable. To confront the institutions that maintain our servitude and misery, we need to listen to the hot-headed, impatient, and courageous fighters as much as we do the cautious, negotiating, and compromising peacemakers. It's about context, not morality, the forces of history, or universal applicable strategies. We are all damaged people who need to heal and not just fight. We partly do this with others with whom we share affinities and openness for intimacy. We also need to analyze civilization or domination generally and share our insights through debates, pamphlets, publications, and discussion. And we need to help create communities and or cultures of resistance by contributing to various projects that fellow rebels are involved in, yet personal he healing, propaganda, and putting our energy into community projects, no matter how worthy, still don't confront the military occupation we are presently living under. Even attempts at rewilding are vain if we don't push the general uh, for a generalized, effective, long-term push against military, protected, centralized authority. History is not only the story of imperial civil civilizations targeting and conquering others, but it is also a chronicle of the resistance to that conquest. I have allies and kin that extend back millennia. They have won countless battles. There has been successful resistance in every area, every era. In order to honor these ancestors, we need to give them thanks and keep up the fight. In military theory, it is said that for the conquerors to really succeed, the losing population must accept defeat. Otherwise, the conquerors only win after every single person has been killed, which isn't normally the conquerors in, in the conquerors interest because they need slaves and soldiers, etc. A very large part of the population unfortunately has accepted defeat so i want to repeat that sharing our unique world views and critiques and creating community are essentially or are as essential as acquiring martial skills a martial component is simply one part 
but we also must remember that a small band of rebels can accomplish a lot, even succeeding in leading relatively free lives away from capitalist civilization. In Ireland in the early 19, 1900s, small local militias with not even enough rifles to go around succeeded in thwarting the design of one of the most powerful empire on the planet for decades. They were successfully partly because they used many martial skills from spying to engagement in actual battles, but also because they had widespread support. The fighters could melt back into the population. Disadvantaged fighters need widespread support to win. With this in mind, it's helpful when rebels stay put in one region and make strong bonds with the land and the inhabitants there. Perhaps, over time, the embers of authentic communities with martial skills will begin to glow, and maybe these seemingly uh, isolated embers will one day gather themselves into small local fires, and hopefully, you'll be a rebel around one of these fires. The Art of Rebellion Part 2 I hope that I could stimulate some interest not in the outrage and tragedy that is conventional war, but in the art of revolt. The principles of the art of rebellion might apply to regional secession, guerrilla warfare, or insurgency. They might apply among a group of friends doing their best to confront imperialism of the market within their potential territory or their neighborhood. They might allow a stunted, humiliated individual to find dignity and achieve small success along her life path rather than resignation. While conflict, even armed conflict, is, a natural, uh, is as natural as a rainy day in the Pacific Northwest, war and large-scale invasions in the interests of the elite or ideology, violent brutality as continuation of politics seems to only begin with urban civilization. I have read about the exploits of Hannibal, Ex Alexander the Great, Caesar, Napoleon, and so on. There is so much to learn from them, but little to be inspired by. There's a story of wretched masses, impoverished by the skill and insanity of the conflicts in their lands, of obedient soldiers dutifully following the orders of their superiors. It is a story of plunder and rape and pillage and of senseless slaughter and bloodshed against war. War generally has little to do with real courage and more to do with a superficial heroism based primarily in self-preservation. Although one does not find or one does find examples of extraordinary bravery and solidarity, a humanity that asserts itself in the midst of inhumane uh, calls to a class where, from one point of view, represent, represent an, an ignorance of the reality of war or an example of a general lack of vocabularies among radicals who want to overthrow the present order. These calls are often a shallow romanticism, frequently the privilege of those who live in peace. I am interested in the reawakening and celebration of the fighting spirit. The call is not for war, but an end to war through revolution. Timxa, Pontiac, Zapata, Machno, Gabriel Dumont, Crazy Horse, Darudi, the uncontrollables everywhere. These are my heroes. I'm sure you have friends, neighbors, or acquaintances who have a fighting spirit, who stand up to the bullies around them, who aren't afraid to speak their mind, who give support to rebellious practices, be it through attitudes or actions. This is a spirit that should be acknowledged and encouraged, especially when it coincides with anarchic desires. Martial skills are useful for everybody, including those who simply want to irritate, to vandalize, to commit small low-level attacks designed to make public their hatred of the institutions and managers of this culture, and a uh, clandestine group of friends that creates beauty by a destructive means or spreads subvers uh, subversion by using playful methods can also benefit from and help inf inform the martial approaches I'm advocating. 
Many rebels are anxious to explore the possibilities that successful resistance might offer. And outside of these milieus, there are others whose communities or friends are threatened and haven't the skills to act on their desires. Can we challenge the institutions that rule over rule our lives without losing? Ongoing ecological catastrophes cascading into a potential collapse make the situation urgent. Institutions of dominations are global, but this doesn't mean that to overcome this planetary regime, local confrontations and, occup and occupations are futile. Perhaps the mega monsters can be torn apart limb by limb. Low intensity insurgency based on primary or based primarily on unconventional warfare tactics is one possible avenue to pursue. I am not promoting a resistance dominated by a sea of humorless revolutionaries. Rather, these insurgencies would be primarily based among groups of friends in geological or genuine communities. This usually implies some degree of mutual beneficial and trusting relationship between the actual fighters and the folks around them. Presently, there seems to be widespread interest among anarchists in exploring a variety of martial arts. They're also interested uh, interest in destructive actions, occupations of shelters, and of food producing low uh, land bases, and survival or wilderness skills, etc. The urgency brought on by the sh shredding of the green world has helped create a rebel milieu anxious to fight for a future. And this era has also helped rebels back into our bodies. There will always be philosophers, incisive people who easily juggle ideas, but hopefully we will now begin to honor those with sensual wisdom among us as well. More women and indigenous, indigenous traditionalists, those with survival skills and earth knowledge, even so-called rednecks, real, real outlaws with whom we could be building bridges. A more rounded approach seems necessary if we're going to succeed in our desires for healthy communities and individuals. So perhaps once our philosoph our philosoph philosophizing is, a com uh, is complemented by an equal degree of pursuit of sensual knowledge, including martial skills, a more significant threat will begin to emerge, and the, the more we integrate these abilities into our uh, ideas, the more confident and healthy we will be, and the more likely we will begin to see opportunities that were previously that we were previously blind to against militarization. Integrating the arts of rebellion into our self-organizing -or doesn't imply an iota of hierarchical structure and arrogant superiors and obedient ranks. Obviously, we don't want to militarize rebellion. The hope is that potential insurgents will develop a richer vocabulary and experience around conflict. There, there's, there is, for instance, an enormous difference between attacking and invading and fighting or between claiming and occupying we can explore these and many different uh other differences and concepts training camp uh training camps places where radical theory survival skills and martial arts are learned and shared could be useful having these types of abilities could could be helpful even life-saving luckily it is isn't necessary to reinvent combative skills because they are timeless truths and principles that apply to all combat. Suntaz. Suntaz is actually a uh, honorific title given to Sun Wu, the author of The Art of War. There is some debate about the original title of this famous text, which some of you may be interested in because it seems that the author intended to suggest martial arts rather than war. In some case, Suntaz 
um, looked at both the philosophy of conflict as well as the conduct of military operations, especially maneuvers and combat, making his writings as they stand useful to anarchist rebels. The Art of War is an important text and should be widely read by potential insurgents. This isn't to say that Suntaz was an anarchist, rather that his writings are poetic and open-ended enough to be used by just about anyone interested in being vic victorious in combat or conflict. This means that many, many people have read them, including your adversaries. Therefore, to succeed, study this text, among others, and aim to be on equal footing with your opponents, at least in theoretical knowledge. The Art of War is widely available, but I thought I'd share some of my favorite quotes from one of the translations. Those skilled in warfare establish positions that make them invincible, and do not miss an opportunity to attack the enemy. Generally in battle, use the, co uh, the common to engage the enemy and the uncommon to gain victory. Those skilled at uncommon maneuvers are as endless as the heavens and earth, and inexhaustible as the rivers and seas. To be certain to take what you attack, attack where your enemy cannot defend. To be certain of, of safety where, uh, when defending, defend where the enemy cannot attack. Subtle, subtle. They become formless, mysterious, mysterious. They become soundless. In armed struggle, the difficulty is turning the securities into the direct and turning adversity into advantage. Therefore, if you make the enemy's route securitous and bait him with advantages, the, uh, though you start out behind him, you will arrive before him. Our own parables. One of the ways that I understand Suntaz is through the use of genre in which he expressed himself. While there is no reason to reinvent useful philosophies of combat and conflict, we can pass on new parables, ones that grow out of our own experiences and insights. For example, based on some of the discussions that friends and I have been having, new ideas have begun to emerge which might be helpful to others. The notion here is that we can all contribute to philosophy philosophical meditations on revolt based on our own study and experience. This sharing might help our projects and attempts and make each of us more worthy opponents of the mega machine. I think that it is safe to say that anarchist insurgents are a small minority within almost every given population. It is a certainty tr uh, it is certainly true where I live. For many reasons, mobility, lack of kinship, ties, etc., we are a dispersed group of people. Yet it is important, from the perspective of the art of rebellion, to at all times concrete one's, uh, concentrate one's forces, especially on a vital point to the enemy. Naturally, those in control of the repressive apparatus are aware of such things and have planned and trained accordingly. Right control tactics, for instance, are an example of this. So rather than r remaining inactive out of fear of losing a direct confrontation as a group and thus remaining defeated, we can find ways to act as a group without appearing as a group. Remember Suntaz. Subtle, subtle. They become formless, formless. We can con uh, concentrate our forces. Uh, we just can't let our enemy know that that's what we're doing until it's too late. Black, lo uh, black blocks often come close to achieving this. Every potential rebel exists in different circumstances. Regardless of the fact we all live within various prisons of capitalist civilization, therefore it is up to you to decide if it's best for an in-the-street prolonged collective confrontation at a counter summit, all dressed in black for instance, or whether it is wi wiser to avoid uniforms appear to be unconnected individuals and coordinate an action that occurs quickly following which the uh following which the participants melt away the latter would be an example of of acting as a group without appearing as a group napoleon's campaigns since sun tzu there's been innumerable uh treaties and theoretical 
works on war. For instance, in the first century AD, Sextus Julius Frontanius wrote a book called On Military Affairs. Brizium produced uh, both strat Stratican by Marcus and a Tactica by Leon the Wise. There are many such books, but I believe that overall they have uh, they have little to benefit for our purpose. Although a history or a scholar could find much value there. Much later in Europe during Napoleon's reign, and in fact inspired by uh, successful campaigns Karl van Clausewitz wrote on war this is the only text that compares its importance and originality to Suntas as pointed out many uh, treaties much later in Europe during Napoleon's reign and in fact inspired by his successful campaigns Karl van Clausewitz wrote on war this is the only text that compares in importance and originality to Suntas. As pointed out, many treatises on various aspects of war and military approaches had been written after Suntas, but Clausewitz was the first to introduce a philosophical perspective on it, and he did so thoroughly. His contributions are enormous. I won't attempt to summarize his ideas, but I will mention some of the areas that he explored and some of the terms that he used. Clauswitz wrote about the essential unpredictability of war, explored the asymmetrical relationship between attack and defense, came up with useful concepts of fog and friction in war, and emphasized that there must be a accu uh, accumulating point of an offense. Commenters also remind us that he used dialectical method to present his ideas, making them sometimes difficult to understand. If you are truly interested in military theory, then Clausewitz is a must read. It would be difficult for any writer on these topics to claim to not have been influenced by him. Clausewitz had a uh, contemporary, Antoni. Antoni and Henry Jamali, who also largely stimulated, or who also largely stimulated by Napoleon's campaign to search for theory or a collection of laws on war. He is worth investigating for a fuller understanding of the development of the theory of combat. Finally, there's J.F.C. Fuller, one of the greatest military thinkers of the 20th century. He is nearly as important as, Cla as Clausewitz, if only because his influence is also widespread, but his ambition was not as great. The principles of war, as they have been known for nearly a century, were first codified by him. The U.S. Army lists the principles of war found in one of their basic field manuals is almost identical to the list first compiled by Fuller. Let's have a brief look at these. The principles of war mass bring decisive force to bear at a criti at critical times and places objective define a decisive and attainable objective for every military operation offensive seize and retain and exploit the initiative surprise strike the enemy at a time or place and in a manner for which he is unprepared security Never permit the enemy to acquire an unexpected advantage. Economy of force. Allocate minimal essential com combat power to secondary efforts. Movement and maneuver. Move, move the enemy, or place the enemy in a position of disadvantage through the flexible application of combat power. Unity of command. For every objective, there must be a unified effort. Simplicity. Prepare clear on complicated plans, complex plans are more likely to be misunderstood or to fall apart as soon as something goes wrong. All applied to organized anti-authoritarian rebellion. We should also keep in mind that these are the guiding principles of literally every military organization in the world. The timeless truths of combat. While having been derived from carefully 
Our careful study of centuries, even millennia, of human history can, with a little imagination, be applied to social struggles as well. These truths seem to apply in all combative situations regardless of changes in technology of conflicts. Keep in mind that these princi principles and truths are not necessarily intended to be used in direct military battles against state forces, although they can be used in this way. They can also be used in fighting against gentrification, protecting your autonomous space from being destroyed or its valuables taken, to stop developments, to occupy or reoccupy land, etc. And you will notice that the truths of, com uh, truths of combat often coincide with basic principles of war elaborated on earlier. The first and most important truth is that defense is stronger or the stronger form of combat. This is a quote from Clausewitz, but he was not the first to make this realization. All things being equal, it would seem that the side with the defensive posture will likely succeed, and a defender will, uh, with well-placed and well-protected forces, even with less weaponry or less experience or fewer people, can still have an enormous advantage. The practice here would be to dig in, make fortifications, don't yield for as long as possible, and your opponent will surely take heavy losses and may even retreat. An example, a group of friends has spent the last seven years building a wilderness camp as a place to hunt and fish from, to, to go to and gather medications and food, to escape the capitalist civil, uh, from capitalist civilization, in short, to practice green ways. Somehow a group of opponents forced forestry officials or whatever has not only discovered the camp but has decided to remove the squatters these officials are intent on evicting the camp dwellers luckily one of the camp occupants is uh while doing a regular peripheral sweep has spotted the officials on their way up she returns to camp and warns everyone because the camp dwellers have studied and practiced martial skills they don't just panic and abandon their camp and its valuables. Rather, they are confident from the knowledge that, that because they have the defensive posture, they may have advan or ha have min uh, enjoy many advantages and will put these advantages to maximum use by combining them with other skills they have acquired through collective study and practice. In all likelihood, the officials will soon give up and return home or retreat to seek reinforcements, giving the rebels a chance to hold on to their position long enough to gather the stuff, avoid rest or in, uh, arrest or injury, and hopefully escape to another camp. The defensive posture is the strongest, so it makes absolute sense to focus on where one can have an impact, namely where, uh, namely where you live, here and now, and with the confidence that comes with knowing that we... Th uh, that should you manage to to wrest even a small area from authority in the market, you will have a good chance of holding on to it for a long time, perhaps long enough for other areas to accomplish the same, join you and open up new fronts. In fairness, however, the second truth must also be remembered. An attacker willing to pay the price can always penetrate the strongest defensive. defensive. Some military theorists have noted or notice that superior combative power always wins. This is the third truth of war. All other things being equal, fate smiles on the side with the greatest combat power. For this reason, it makes absolutely no sense for a minority of revolutionaries in North America to contemplate attempting to outright, or attempting an outright military contest against the police and the army. The state's combat power is simply overwhelming. So it might be better to focus on making friends within the military and hoping for mutinies or at least treacherous acts like providing gear or information to outsiders. In any event, destroying the, uh, destroying imp the imperialism of the market is not a military exercise. Military skills or martial skills are primarily helpful when oc uh, occupying or reoccupying for indigenous people and or Defend, uh, defending territory, for building the confidence to initiate small battles and to act as a grounding influence for dreamers. 
There will there will be times, however, when the insurgents will have the superior com combat or superior combat power, and this would be the time not to be afraid, but to push and succeed. The fourth truth of combat is what Clausewitz refers to as friction in war. During any combat operation, most activities are hindered by mistakes, the dispersal effects of firepower and disruption. Caused by confusion and fear in a, a potentially lethal environment, etc., practicing in, in the safety of your local wilderness or in a camp or dojo is not the same as the real thing. The pace essentially suffers, and therefore allowances must be made during the planning stages for this friction. Keep, uh, keep this truth in mind when planning to disrupt a gathering of economic, e economists or polit politicians, for instance, and you will less likely be thrown off by the friction and its effects. Achieving surprise in a combative situation is extremely important. This is the fifth truth. An, uh, analysts of historical uh, military confrontations has shown that surprise actually significantly increases the combat power of the side that achieves it. In fact, as mentioned in part one, surprise is the greatest of combat multipliers. As noted above, it is included in the U.S. Army's list of principles of war. T.S. Dupley writes that offensive action is essential essential to the positive combat results as his first truth. Defense and, strength, uh, defense and strength and surprise are important, but ultimate combat success involves offensive acts, action. Even should a strategy of overall defensive posture be a plan, for example, uh, successful local upheavals which are surrounded by hostile adversaries, Offensive tactics and operations must be selectively employed for final victory. While the purpose of this chapter is to encourage the study and practice of martial skills, the focus on strategy and tactics generally, and when specifically military on the ground, uh, on the ground combat, I have completely ignored air and naval th uh, theoretists such thinkers do exist, and any insurgency would have to deal with it, with aspects of each. Many, if not most, of state forces today use a combination of land and air combat. For instance, high-tech, high-performance helicopters will often do re uh, reconnaissance that directs faraway tanks and extremely specific GPS coordinates to their targets. Land cam uh, combat today is rarely uns uh, unsupported by fixed-wing aircraft, drones, or helicopters. Thus, we should uh, more accurately speak of air-land battle in many instances. As for naval combat, these ideas can be applied effectively to deter and harass navies or to initiate small-scale naval combat. Although we mustn't forget about the power and potential of a sailor's mutiny. I think that what you can learn from these uh, introductions and ideas, especially if you followed up by your own study and practice, can be applied to all areas of conflict. Tactics and strategy. One important and useful uh, exploration is the distinction between tactics and strategy. Kloschwitz believed that Strategy, uh, strategy belo uh, belonged primarily to the realm of art, while tactics belonged primarily to the realm of science. From the military point of view, strategy is the planning and managing of resources available in warfare. The military and political elite, i.e., those with national power to influence these, matter, uh, these matters, do this. Just below... Uh, strategy. The military uses the term operations when the direction of armies or large forces in the military usually com uh, combat activities within a clearly defined theater is involved. Conceptually, operations lie between strategy and tactics when engaged in combat. Tactics are the specific uh, techniques used to achieve your strategy. Uh, strategic ends. They are influenced by local conditions, or you can say the context 
that determines your choice. Tactics are the detailed maneuvers or offensive used to achieve the objectives of your strategy. They are often plans. They are often plans and moves that gain advantages in the short term, while strategy is a larger scale framework of direction and control. You can practice your tactics, but you must use intuition for your strategy. Sieges. One might think that studying the techniques of sieges would only be of interest to hobbyists and scholars of medieval warfare, but this isn't the case. Only quite recently, from 1992 to 1996, the city of Sarajevo was under siege during the Phoenician War. And, uh, in fact, I've noticed that many of the most significant conflicts that occurred tend to have siege qualities to them. If you look at the Oka, look at Oka Ganasfin Lake, Move, Caledonia, Squad Evictions, etc., we find sieges and siege techniques used on both sides. A siege is a military blockade of a city or fortress with the intent of conquering by force or attrition, often occupied uh, by an assault. A siege occurs when the attacker encounters a city or fortress that refuses to surrender and cannot easily be taken by a frontal assault. Sieges involve surrounding the target and blocking the reinforcement or escape of troops or provision supplies, a tactic known as investment. Typically coupled with attempts to reduce the fortification, fortification by means of siege engines, artillery bombardment, mining also known as sapping or the use of deception or treachery to bypass defenses failing in military outcome sieges can often be decided by starvation thirst disease or disease which can aff uh, afflict both the attacker or the defender generally speaking siege warfare is a form of low intensity warfare until an assault takes place characterized in that at least one party holds a strong defense po uh, position. It is a highly static situation. The element of attrition is also typically strong and there are plenty of opportunities for negotiations. Variables. Whenever considering an action, it is important to reflect on what Kloschwitz called the variables representing the circumstance of combat. Let's look at this exa uh, at an example. A group of friends decides to destroy a couple bridges in a nearby wilderness to prevent logging and industrial activity. The first step is to look at the many basic security considerations to follow. Don't tell anyone outside the group anything ever. Have alibis. Don't use or carry any techno advices to communicate, document, or brainstorm, etc. The group uses their knowledge of strategy, operations, and tactics in making plans. They are cautious of some of the principles and truths of conflict, surprise, movement, ec economy of force, etc. But what we haven't looked at yet are the variables that typically come into play. The concept of friction does take into account these influences to some extent. Trevor Dupley breaks down the variables into some simple categories although i've tweaked these somewhat there are many that uh, are sure to influence the outcome and smoothness of your action so please make sure so please make sure that variables are considered before pursuing your objective the variables are environmental behavioral and operational under environmental we find primarily the weather and terrain, although I would include season, time of day, and even lunar cycles important. Secondly, we find behavioral variables. These relate to the physiology and nature of human participants. Morale, training, emotional well-being, stability, drug and alcohol use, experience, etc. Finally, operational includes vulnerability, mobility, fatigue, and posture. 
it should be noted that we <clears throat> have e uh, easy influence over these and should take advantage of this fact. The environmental. It's cold and rainy. Will this affect the terrain enough to make any changes? Does a group need to make a fire, perhaps to burn the bridge? If so, can they make a fire in the rain? They were counting on a full moon to help, but the clouds will inhibit this. Do they have a flashlight? Heavier clothing can slow down one's escape. The area is primarily a deciduous forest, so in spring there'll be plenty of coverage from the from the leaves, but it's autumn. Can they hide behind the bare branches? The behavioral. Is it going to be a rainy or cold night and one of the group is a, inexperienced or weak? One might want to make sure that his backpack is checked for proper clothing and that he's rested enough to do the action. Perhaps consider pairing him up with a stronger, more experienced participant, etc. If you expect to be confronted, who has the most training to stand firm? Who is likely to flee? The operational. Will the rain make it, uh, make it muddy and slow down the vehicles? Does everyone have proper clothing? If the group will have to sit still and hide for a long period of time in uncomfortable circumstances, has everyone been trained for this long enough? Variables and the reality of friction are essential essential last considerations to ponder before sitting out to the battle.